So after much anticipation, I finally got my hands on the real MacBook Pro for this generation, the touch bar enabled version. Now we already reviewed the version of the MacBook Pro without touch bar and went in depth on the design, the keyboard, screen, etc. So I'm gonna spare you the rehash, but please check out that video if you haven't done so already. Apple's touch bar enabled 13 inch MacBook Pro starts at $1799, but you can upgrade it with a faster i7 processor, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and up to a terabyte PCIe SSD. My config with the fastest processor, maxed out RAM, and 512 gigabyte SSD cost $2,500, but by doubling storage space, you can actually exceed three grand after taxes. Apple storage is extremely fast as we noted in previous benchmarks in the last video, but the prices continue to amaze me. All touch bar enabled MacBook Pros come with processors sporting a 28 watt TDP, which means that these machines feature a higher heat threshold, and as a result, they can theoretically run at higher speeds for a longer period of time. You'll notice some subtle design differences to help dissipate heat. For starters, there are two intake ports on the left and right underside of the unit to bring in cool air. There's also an extra fan around back, but the noise increase from that extra fan isn't all that noticeable. The presence of the touch bar, intake ports, extra fans, and other subtle design differences means that there's actually a smaller battery inside this MacBook Pro when compared to the entry level model without the touch bar. But performance between this machine and the entry level model without touch bar is noticeably better as it should be considering it's a thousand dollars more. 4K video editing in Final Cut Pro 10 didn't stutter at all like it did on the entry level model. So that is a very big plus for video editors. The touch bar enabled MacBook Pro features an additional two USB-C ports on the right side of the chassis next to the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. There are obvious benefits to having more ports, which means you can connect more USB and Thunderbolt 3 enabled devices. But the biggest benefit, at least in my eyes, is the flexibility offered by having ports on both sides of the MacBook Pro. Since USB-C cables are used to charge the MacBook, it means that you can plug in charging cables on either side. Mind blown, right? Yes, MagSafe will definitely be missed, but you're going to appreciate the flexibility that this offers if you use your MacBook in different places throughout the day. Now, while the touch bar is the machine's headlining feature when it comes to marketing, I feel like Touch ID is just as important, if not more so. The Touch ID sensor is located in the same place as the MacBook's power button, which is in the upper right hand corner of the keyboard. Yes, Apple Pay support is here, which means that you'll be able to directly authenticate purchases in supported sites within the Safari browser without needing to use an iPhone or Apple Watch to authenticate. The initial setup process for both Touch ID and Apple Pay is just as straightforward as it is on iOS, and users can access system preferences after the fact to further configure each service. One thing that is different, however, is that you can only register three fingers with Touch ID instead of the full five fingers like you can on an iOS device. But in macOS, you can have multiple user accounts and each user account can have its own set of fingerprints. And then you can actually log in to a specific account from the login screen just by using a fingerprint. It's gonna automatically know which account to log into. But one of the best things about having Touch ID is that it's open to third-party developers. And you can probably imagine how fast I rushed over to the App Store to download 1Password, which will allow me to access its interface with my fingerprint instead of repeatedly typing in my master password throughout the day. That is great. Now let's talk about Touch Bar. I purposely saved the touch bar for last because it's been a topic of intense debate within my head. The touch bar is of course the small matte touch enabled strip of glass that resides above the number keys and outright replaces the keyboard's function keys. But don't worry, you can still access the function keys at any time by, yep, you guessed it, holding the function button on the keyboard. Initially, I found myself accidentally invoking the touch bar due to the way that I'm used to resting my hands on the Mac's keyboard. You too may find that it takes an adjustment period to get used to having a touchscreen on your Mac. The touch bar's claim to fame is that it dynamically changes depending on the app you're using, and Apple has done a really good job of fine tuning the interface, making it extremely snappy and responsive, even when quickly command tabbing through open apps. And nearly all of Apple's apps have been updated with touch bar support, and many third party apps feature support as well. The great thing about the touch bar is that it's truly dynamic, meaning that it's not just a direct one-to-one -one replacement for function keys or keyboard shortcuts. iOS inspired sliders, for instance, are very enjoyable to use. A simple tap, hold, and slide gesture, for example, will let you quickly adjust things like volume, brightness, etc. And you'll find all sorts of unique input situations depending on the app that you're using. The touch bar is broken up into three main sections, but the two most prominent sections are the control strip on the right side and the larger area in the middle of the touch bar dedicated to apps. 
The control strip features four system level shortcuts for doing things like invoking mute or accessing Siri, but by tapping the left arrow button, you can expand the control strip to showcase many more system functions. And the control strip can be fully customized by heading over to system preferences. Customizing the touch bar is very well done as it allows you to drag items from the main screen into the touch bar area, and it's all very seamless. And of course, if allowed, apps featuring touch bar support can be customized as well. It's too early for me to fully judge the new touch bar because I simply haven't been able to use it for long enough to finalize my opinion. And I think part of the reason for that is that the touch bar lacks any sort of haptic response that would make touch typing more feasible. So you'll find yourself staring down the interface, which can slow down your workflow. I'm someone that's really big on remembering and using keyboard shortcuts, no matter how complex. Thus, I can usually perform a keyboard shortcut faster than I can locate a button on the touch bar. With all that said, there are some features that the touch bar provides that are just really cool. Having volume and brightness sliders, for instance, is just awesome, especially coming from an iOS device and using adjustment sliders inside of third-party apps is an enjoyable experience as well. Color pickers inside of apps like Pixelmator and sliders to adjust the size of various assets as a real benefit that can help speed up workflows. And it's especially useful when using apps in full screen mode with hidden toolbars. But for every few cool experiences, there's a head scratcher as well. For example, why does Apple insist on showing screenshots of your open Safari tabs on the touch bar's tiny screen? The touch bar is way too small to discern anything like a website, and it just looks like a smush, pixelated mess. It's going to take a while for the newness of the touch bar during 13-inch MacBook Pro to sink in, but after using this machine for an entire day, it feels like a much bigger upgrade than the entry-level model. I love the presence of the four USB-C ports, which makes connecting USB-C peripherals and chargers super easy. I also know that I thoroughly enjoy having Touch ID on my Mac. This machine is definitely faster than the entry-level MacBook Pro without touch bar, and it'll be able to handle things like 4K video editing pretty well, and even better if you upgrade the processor. Speed-wise, it's not going to knock your socks off, but I found that it handled whatever I could throw at it, including 4K video editing, just fine. But the MacBook Pro's biggest new feature, the touch bar, has yet to fully win me over. From a pure technical perspective, it is very well executed, but I almost feel like the touch bar is there to solve a problem that wasn't necessarily that big of a problem in the first place, at least for me. Perhaps I'm in the minority due to my adeptness with keyboard shortcuts, but I'm still on the fence about the amount of value added by this new input method. At the end of the day, the new MacBook Pro is a solid release that's going to make a lot of folks happy, but it may leave others expecting something slightly more, a little underwhelmed. What do you think? Let me know down below in the comment section. This is Jeff with 9to5Mac.